Let's talk about the lumbopelvic hip complex biomechanics with glute exercises. So here I've got a spine and pelvis model, and I want to teach you why we coach various exercises the way we do here at Glute Lab. So first let's discuss lumbopelvic rhythm. So the pelvis and hips and lumbar spine have sort of a rhythm to them. The pelvis can rotate forward and backward, and when it does, the spine tends to go with it a little bit. So when you anteriorly tilt the pelvis, like I do here, you get some lumbar extension. When you posteriorly pelvic tilt the pelvis, you get some lumbar flexion. So there's lumbar motion associated with a pelvic motion. Now, Mel Siff first pointed this out in his book, Super Training, but he mentioned that when you're at the bottom of a lift, like a squat or a deadlift, you want a little bit of anterior pelvic tilt. The reason why you want this is because as you pull from the ground, the load is trying to pull you into flexion. So just the attempt to create an a little bit of anterior tilt is gonna protect you from going into those dangerous levels of lumbar flexion. Now I also mentioned that during exercises like loaded carries or sit-ups, you want slight posterior pelvic tilt simply because it's trying to pull you into lumbar extension and that'll buttress you against going into that. Now, how does the spine get damaged? There are many mechanisms for back-related injuries and pain, but during lumbar flexion, you will have the erectors and the ab muscles, basically any muscle that attaches from the rib cage to the pelvis. And when these muscles contract, like the erectors, abdominals in the front, obliques, you're gonna have compressive forces. So picture a rib cage here and picture muscles kind of clamping down. This creates compressive forces which pushes down. Most people mistakenly assume that having a bar on your back or a bar on your hands creates a ton of compressive force in here when that only contributes a small percentage. The majority of the percentage comes from the muscles themselves counteracting those loads and really clamping down on the spine. So when the spine doesn't have compressive forces and it moves around in flexion and extension, it's not as dangerous. Unloaded movements don't tend to cause injuries. It's when you have the compressive forces and then you flex and extend, that's when it's increasingly more dangerous. And you'll even see here on this model, they've got a herniation because when you have compression and then you flex significantly, what happens at the disc level, you can see here, if I push this way, you can envision this pinches together and then it pushes the nucleus rearward and you end up with a posterolateral disc herniation as you see here. So how does this apply to squats and deadlifts and hip thrusts and back extensions? squats and deadlifts, you're going to have compressive forces. There's no way around it because as you bend over to pick up the weight in a deadlift or as you squat down, you lean forward. If you erectors weren't activated, you would round over completely. So they have to be activated in order to use good form. And that erector activation creates that compressive force. So you're going to have high compressive forces. And so when you have compressive forces, you want to make sure you remain mostly neutral. Well, again, the studies that measure lumbar spine movement during heavy resistance exercise show that even when you're trying to remain in neutral, you always end up flexing a little bit, usually around 26 degrees. So that intent to create lumbar extension and anterior pelvic tilt as you pull the weight off the ground helps safeguard you from going into flexion. But you want to minimize the amount of motion here under the high compressive forces during squats and deadlifts, and that's why I recommend slight anterior pelvic tilt at the bottom. Now, if you go deep in a squat and you have poor hip flexion mobility, your femur will actually collide here and pull you into butt wink or posterior pelvic tilt in a squat. In a deadlift, if you have poor hamstring flexibility, you'll bend over and you'll just end up rounding because your hamstrings run out. So in that case, you can't hold anterior pelvic tilt while going deep. So make sure that you don't, don't go too deep for your anatomical limitations. 
Now let's talk about the hip thrust. So a lot of coaches in a hip thrust say that you should try to stay neutral, okay? This would be staying neutral. But I believe that as you rise up, you should actually post your pelvic tilt like this. And the reason why is because if you stay in neutral, you always end up arching a little bit. You end up going into some extension like this. And this is confirmed by EMG, which shows that you're getting a similar amount of erector activity during hip thrust as deadlifts when you stay in neutral. So you're getting high compressive forces with that extension, which is problematic. When you have high compressive forces and extension, you're more likely to damage these posterior elements of the spine, like the facet joints, for example. So you're more likely to cause injury and pain when you have high compressive forces and extension. However, when you post your pelvic tilt, you're using the glutes to help extend the hips because posterior pelvic tilt is very similar to hip extension in the sense that in your acetabulum, doing this versus doing this is similar. You wouldn't know the difference in the acetabulum. So posterior pelvic tilt mimics hip hyperextension. So basically, you're using the glutes to take you from here to here, and you're minimizing the erector activation. So when you reduce erector activation, you reduce the compressive forces, and you use the glutes to extend the hip. You're using glutes to post your pelvic tilt, not abdominals. If you tried to do a crunch actively and use the abdominals to post your pelvic tilt, then you'd create those compressive forces. But the glutes don't create compressive forces at the spine. So here you have markedly reduced compressive forces. Also, you're gonna have reduced shear forces. And so this ends up being a much safer lift, okay? Yes, you might go into a little bit of flexion here, but it's unloaded. So to reiterate, here you are at the bottom of a hip thrust, all right? This would be staying in neutral. When people try to do this, as they rep to failure, or as they go a little too heavy, they always end up anterior tilting like this and extending the lumbar spine. And this is when pain occurs. This is when you get damage to the posterior elements of the spine. So to safeguard against this, I recommend posterior pelvic tilting. So you end up at the top like this. And this way, you minimize the compressive forces. So the spinal motion associated with this, a little bit of flexion, doesn't incur any damage and you use mostly glutes and it's more of a pure hip extensor exercise because you're using glutes and hamstrings and minimizing erector activity and this makes it safer over the long run. So as you can see, spinal biomechanics is a complicated topic and you can't just assume that you should use the same exact spinal and pelvic posture no matter what the exercise because it depends whether the load is axial as in the case of a squat or a deadlift and it comes vertical relative to the body versus horizontal as is the case of hip thrusts or even back extensions where you're coming up like that. In this case, you'd use a different lumbopelvic hip complex strategy depending on whether the load is horizontal versus vertical or anteroposterior versus axial. Thanks for watching.